Mulder, why did you make me come out here? Scully, I finally figured it out. This is a conspiracy that reaches to the highest levels of government and beyond. Everybody's involved. George Stephanopoulos, Beyonce, Tom Brady, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Phil Collins. Definitely Phil Collins. Mulder, I've seen you like this before. Remember when you thought Cokie Roberts was an alien? She looks like one. Anybody could have made that mistake. But that's beside the point. It's the government trying to make it look like the work of extraterrestrial, extra tech extra, uh, extra trash. <laughs> it's not funny, Scully. Wouldn't that be the perfect way to silence me? What if they operated on my brain so I couldn't say it? Can't say what? Extra parchesial. Oh, extra terrestrial. <laughs> oh. Wait, wait, let's say you had some terrestrials, but you also had one to spare. What would you have? An extra terrestrial. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> this is killing me. We'll be talking about X-Files later on The Scramble today. Also, Phil Collins. But first, the conservative revolt against Donald Trump. And now he wants to believe that his Legolas poster can see him. Colin McEnroe. I sometimes think about that anyway. Yeah, so we have a lot of things that we need to talk about today, and we are very excited to do all those things. Uh, Later on the show, as has been suggested, we will talk about The X-Files, rebooted as of last night. Uh, Also... Uh, in that same conversation with Willa Paskin, television critic for Slate.com, we'll talk about why Trevor Noah doesn't seem to have, well, I mean, it would be hard for him to have the same kind of influence on the public debate that John Stewart has, but maybe his influence is even less than might have been imagined. And then we're going to talk, about, talk to two downstate musicians who are gathering in a hip space for a tribute to the frequently unhip, although not always unhip, Phil Collins. So we'll talk about uh, Phil Collins, one of those potentially divisive musical figures that we enjoy discussing. But we're at the, here at the beginning, we are going to talk about the current political scene. We are honored to have with us the guy who I would say has written the most cited article, the most frequently cited article, certainly by me anyway, but I think just in general, the most frequently cited article uh, of, I don't know, maybe the last nine months or so, uh, in, in, in terms of sort of summing up this unprecedented and very difficult to pin down political phenomenon that has resulted in the strong candidacies of Donald Trump and to a certain degree also uh, of Bernie Sanders. So joining us now uh, to talk in particular about the current revolt by the National Review against the candidacy of Donald Trump and all the things that go along with that. David from a senior editor at The Atlantic and chairman of Policy Exchange. Uh, he was a speechwriter for George W. Bush in 2001 to 2002. Uh, he's with us now by phone. Hi. Welcome to the hey. show. Thank you very much. First of all, you wrote this uh, piece for The Atlantic about the the Great Republican Revolt, um, which I thought really kind of got to what we've all been trying to pin down and talk about, which is whence comes this constituency for Donald Trump uh, and, and how is it different from what you might call a classic conservative constituency? So before we plunge into the latest developments, maybe you can do yeah. your kind of nutshell version of that. All right. Um it, the story starts in 2012, um, after uh, the Republicans um, lo- lost re- uh, the Obama re-election. Um, most important people in the party were quite convinced that Mitt Romney had that election in the bag. Um, I was not one of those. Uh, I, had a, I published a book called Why Romney Lost on the Thursday uh, after the Tuesday vote. And while I write fast, I promise you I don't write that fast. Uh, the, the party then did a postmortem to try to understand what had gone wrong, how had this shocking defeat occurred. And the analysis that um, Republican donors and members of Congress and talkers uh, and intellectuals and policy activists all came to, and the article is full of quotations uh, from people in the two or three months after the November 2012 vote, they they all came to this conclusion. There was nothing wrong with the core Republican message. There was nothing wrong with the Ryan plan that withdrew the Medicare guarantee from everybody under age 55. Uh, There's nothing wrong with big cutbacks and entitlements. There's nothing wrong with focusing all the resources available on large tax cuts to the wealthiest people in society. Nothing wrong with any of that. The only thing the party had got wrong was the one thing the big donors had never liked anyway, and that was Mitt Romney's steps toward a tougher approach on immigration. So the consensus was what we need to do is jettison the Mitt Romney approach, wholeheartedly embrace immigration, keep everything else, and run uh, in 2016 on a platform of conservatism, classic free enterprise, support for entrepreneurs, um, and uh, more open immigration, but otherwise no changes. And just to pound home how continuous this would be with what we've done before, we'll 
find to head this campaign another Bush. We always do so well with them. And mm. <laughs> that is how the stage was set at the beginning of 2015. And I mean, the question then becomes, I mean, one of the things that you sort of sketch out is that there's this large group of people who feel as though post-2008, the economy recovered, but people didn't. They specifically didn't, but a lot of people didn't. And and so one of the questions that kind of arises out of your piece is, uh, is the, didn't the donor see that this was an obviously stupid approach? Well, there's that. And also, <laughs> is is the Trump movement, are these sort of, in fact, rational actors? I think they're kind of often depicted as this kind of collective barbaric yop, you know, this inchoate howl of die yuppie scum, die immigrants. Um, but, I mean, the opposite or the countervailing argument would be, no, they're actually kind of rational actors. They're looking for somebody who seems to share their concerns. These are your fellow citizens. Um, and however, whatever you think of um, their solutions, their distress is real. Uh, and and let's just take a measure of this. What has happened since the Great Recession uh, is that the top 10, 15 percent of America has had pretty solid recovery. And certainly the top 5 or 6 percent of America has had uh, a very impressive and handsome recovery. And in the top 1 percent and higher, it gets uh, even better than that. But for the lower 60 percent of America, there's been no recovery at all. The typical American household makes $4,000 a year less today than it did in 2007. And it's been exposed to all kinds of shocks and buffets from a world economy that seems ever more hostile. Um, and the immigration issue is one way of getting at this. You know, immigration is not just about people competing with you for jobs, although um, if you're in that part of the labor force, the competition is very real. It also is about um, schools that 20 years ago would have been entirely English-speaking, suddenly having 15% of um, the school population having English as a second language. And that's a very difficult thing for families uh, of English speakers to cope with. The teacher's attention is more distracted. And in states that have seen rapid increases in immigration, places like North Carolina, for example, a big Trump state, um, the shock, has, the acceleration in the number of non-English speakers in classrooms has been sharper than that. Meanwhile, we um, have a world security environment that looks scarier and scarier than um, with, with every passing year. And Donald Trump capitalizes on all of these things. One more thing that has to be said about Donald Trump. Uh, for a lot of people who follow politics closely, um, Trump seems a kind of cartoonish figure. He speaks in a very blowhardy kind of way, and he, you know, um, he says the things that we think of. If they're not ridiculous, they're sinister. If they're not sinister, they're ridiculous. But for tens of millions of people, many more people than will ever watch Bill O'Reilly or Chris Matthews or any program like that, they have seen for nearly a decade, week after week, Donald Trump planning a model of a committed, compassionate, effective leader, somebody who gets things done, somebody who cares about teams, um, somebody who looks at everybody, and someone who will take the tough decisions that on the other TV they see, on the news programs, nobody seems to be making. So in the middle of all this, the National Review, which has been for decades kind of a house organ for classic conservatives, classic conservatism, has staged this revolt. It staged a revolt, a, a kind of a say no to Trump revolt. Right. And, and I mean, the first question is, is this completely beside the point? I mean, my sense of the Trump movement is that the Venn diagram that where the other circle is National Review subscribers, there's a, you know, a tiny, tiny crescent of overlap, if even that. Um, no, th look, these things are important. Um, magazines of opinion matter. I mean, they don't matter overwhelmingly, but they matter at the margin. One, um, the question that a lot of important Republicans are considering right now is what are they going to do about Trump? Mm. Uh, and there are basically three choices. Um, choice number one is you um, go to the person who's in second place and try to um, – mobilize everybody behind him to stop Trump. And that would be Ted Cruz, but he's unacceptable to a lot of Republicans for other reasons. Mm -hmm. Another second choice is you find, well, let's find somebody who's in third place, and we all get together behind him in opposition to guys number one and two. And a final possible choice is, uh, you know what, let's make our peace with Donald Trump and accept him. And we've seen in the past week and, um, some important Iowa politicians going to Trump events and seeming to show some interest in maybe working with him. So what National Review was trying to do was to signal to 
elite actors in the Republican Party, we at National Review, the keepers of the conservative flame, we regard them as entirely unacceptable. And we don't think that you, Chuck Grassley, senator from Iowa, should be um, potentially welcoming him into the Republican fold. We don't think that you, Alex Castellanos, um, former campaign consultant to Mitt Romney in 2008 and frequent guest on television, we don't think you should be getting ready to work with him. We think that there should be a hard line against him. And this is an important discussion within the Republican world. Um, David, and this sort of gets me to a question that I've been asking a lot uh, to anybody who will answer questions that I ask for the last week or so, which is, you know, how likely is it that what you're describing in Iowa with people like Grassley and Castellanos is going to could be generalized, not just within the Republican Republican electorate that's going to vote in the primaries, but imagine imagine that Trump emerging merging on the other side of this process with the nomination. One of the questions that I have is, is there a cohort hort of not low information voters, maybe medium information voters, college educated voters who don't necessarily fit most people's mental profile of the quintessential Trump Trump supporter, but a group of people who look at him and say, and, and maybe they're also temperamentally indisposed to support or vote for Hillary Clinton. And they look at Trump and they say, well, He's not an ideologue. He says demagogic things, but he's not really an ideologue. We kind of know that. And he's a deal maker, as he never lets you forget for 10 seconds, which means maybe he can hammer out compromises. Maybe we need that kind of thing. And and that, you know, is there a second or third wave of Trump supporters who, who maybe are a little bit different from how we imagine Trump supporters to be right now? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, but right now, I can we can tell who will not support Trump. Right now he is least popular with the best educated members of the party, with the most affluent members of the party, and also, interestingly enough, the most religious members of the party. And it's important to note that that some people may have a stereotype that the most religious people are not educated, not affluent. That's not true. But um just as we we've moved into a world in which um marriage is something that you see much more of in upper America, that's now true of church attendance. Regular church attendance is also a marker of affluence and and education. So there's some overlap between these groups. But they are hard set against Donald Trump. Can he woo them over? Well, um, he's going to have a hard case. It's going to be pretty hard for anyone to believe that he's a committed pro-lifer. Um, that, uh, that, is, that, that seems a, you know, that's an important issue for a lot of religious Republicans. And a lot of uh, more traditional Republicans are just going to look at them and not see a precedent, not see somebody with the right temperament, the right personality. Here, but here's um, – so I don't think in the end it's that likely. But here's maybe the, the deeper question that you're pointing to, and this is very worrying. You know, um, most of the time since World War II, and not just in the United States but in all the developed countries, voters are quite risk averse. They know our political systems, our societies are really very successful, uh, and it's easy to mess up. They can they could remember the Depression, World War II, before that. Um, don't take unnecessary risks. Choose cautious people. Um, choose people who look responsible. But that's only true so long as you feel as your society is basically successful. What happens when you have large numbers of people and feel that your society is not successful, not keeping faith? And then we go back to the years before World War II, when in the United States and other countries, voters often – did rally to irresponsible demagogic people because they seemed to offer a solution when the regular politicians had no solution swap. Right. And it seems as though one of the ways in which this candidacy of Trump mirrors the candidacy of Bernie Sanders a bit is that that idea that the conventional institutions don't have useful solutions. Their stuff doesn't really work that well anymore. And the more that Trump or Sanders is rejected by anybody symbolic of conventional two party politics, the better they are, at least with the splinter constituencies they have now. It's it's questionable, you know, how big those balloons can be blown up. But right now, every time they suffer some kind of rejection, it kind of proves their point. Right. Um, yeah, but, uh, I, mean, I think in the end, Bernie Sanders is less likely to go anywhere than, than, than Donald Trump is. Um, Ber- Bernie Sanders... You know, Ber- Bernie Sanders looks like something we've seen before. Um, he looks like Paul Songus in 1992. He looks like Bill Bradley in 2000. Um, he looks like the kind of candidate who, who attracts 
academics, professionals, you know, um, uh, upmarket Ben and Jerry's Democrats, white <laughs> Democrats, um, and that those kinds of candidates always do well in Iowa, New Hampshire, which are states that are older, whiter, more affluent, and full of universities. Um, and then they run into um, the regular Democrats um, who are more minority, younger, not as wealthy, um, often more connected to uh, public sector unions, and whammo. Uh, at that point, the Bill Bradleys and the Paul Tongases disappear before the Al Gores and Bill Clintons and people who represent the regular Democratic Party. Bernie Sanders looks like that. He's, he's doing better right now than uh, Tonkas or um, Bill Bradley did, but he's getting the same voters in more or less the same way. So, uh, and, he's, you know, and he's not a dynamic or inspiring figure. I mean, it's, unlike Donald Trump, where it's interesting to listen to him talk, it's not interesting to listen to Bernie Sanders talk. <laughs> so I think the, the Democratic race will play out in conventional ways. It is the Republican race that really is a wild card. Well, also, I mean, the Democrats are aided by the fact that their gear shift only goes into two positions, right? It's Sanders and it's Clinton. Those are the only two places the gear shift can move. As you lined out for us at the beginning of this conversation, part of the Republican problem is that their gear shift goes into a lot of different positions. It goes into conciliation with Trump. It goes into uh, backing Cruz. It goes into not liking Cruz. And then it goes into all these sort of third place people. You know, and if, if Marco Rubio were some kind of conciliation, census choice, he probably would have been Mitt Romney's running mate four years back in the cycle. So uh, it, it doesn't seem as though in, in that in that particular position of the gear shift, there's just one choice that people well, can Repub- coalesce around. Republicans have a, have a more fundamental choice to make. I end my article in The Atlantic was outlining four paths um, that the party could, could um, choose. Uh, so the, the first path is, you know, the Republican donor elite and congressional elite, it's, it's still confronting the wreckage of the Jeff Bush, Jeb Bush candidacy. It was just so assumed he would be so overwhelming. Um, he raised money on a scale that no one in American politics in American history has ever raised money. It's just unbelievable that, that he, uh, as I say, that, I mean, never in the history of political donations has so much bought so little so fleetingly. So the question that some donors ask is, well, maybe Jeb Bush was just the wrong guy. It wasn't the message. If we can find a more attractive face for the Jeb Bush Bush message, everything will be okay. And that's the basic logic of a Rubio candidate. And the second path is is to say, hmm, you know, this man Trump, he's making some inroads with the immigration issue. You know, back in the 70s, the Republican Party made a deal with the pro-life people. Before 1980, the Republican Party was a party that I wasn't an especially pro-life party. In 1980, they made a deal. They said to the pro-life insurgency, right, you're in. Uh, we're inscribing your um, message in our platform. From now on, we are not, our platform and our nominee will be pro-life. And they brought them in. Could the Republicans do that on the immigration issue? Uh, Ted Cruz uh, is, is offering that alternative. Hey, I'm a pretty regular Republican, but I'm prepared to be more hawkish on immigration than Bush or Ruby or Casey or Christie. Um, try me. A third path, and this is the one that I hope for but is least likely, is a, a serious attempt to address the concerns of the t- Trump voters. What's gone wrong with middle, um, the hopes and prospects of the American middle class? There doesn't seem to be anybody who's advancing that idea, at least not yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and the final possibility is to say, gee, um, you know, in order to defeat Trump, we're going to have to make some real changes. And we don't want to make those changes. They're awkward and inconvenient. And let's not forget that everywhere except the presidency, the Republican Party is an overwhelmingly successful party. It dominates American politics the way no party has dominated it since the Republicans dominated it in the 1920s. You know, Senate, House, and, and, and the states. Maybe we can say, you know what, maybe we're just not good at winning presidential elections, but we win everything else. So no changes uh, and go on, go on defense. Let the Democrats have the presidency. We'll run the rest of the system. That's a very risky fourth strategy, though, because, you know, I mean, the conventional wisdom heading into these down ticket races had been that they more of them would break Democratic anyway this year than than had in the previous cycle. Certainly not enough to restore control of the House, but maybe enough to fundamentally alter the constituency of the Senate. And with a bad top ticket candidate for the Republicans, don't you wind up losing a bunch more of those races? Um, That's. That, that is often said, and that's a real possibility. Um, but whatever happens in 2016, if Hillary Clinton is the president in 2018, Republicans can look forward to a good year uh, that year. Um, the, the, the reason you want the presidency is if your 
you're trying to do things. But if you're mostly trying to stop things, you can stop things just as well from Congress as you can from the presidency, maybe even better. Um, last quick question, David. Uh, the, the Bloomberg trial balloon over the weekend, do we care about this or is this? Uh... Well, well it, 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 it's interesting if it happens. I mean, so far, uh, as far as I can tell, the, the main constituency for Bloomberg candidacy um, are the political consultants who look forward to um, buying Lamborghinis with the proceeds. <laughs> um, it's never quite clear that Bloomberg's really serious about it. It's never clear that, that there are any large numbers of voters who are serious about it. But political consultants see you know, as astonishing as Jeb Bush's 100 plus million uh, was, uh, a theoretical, <laughs> hypothetical Bloomberg billion would be even better. Just imagine the fees on that. <laughs> Yes, I think that uh, that Bloomberg's putting it in all the contracts that they have to buy Teslas. But, uh, David, from, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Read David's essay in The Atlantic on the Republican revolt and then whatever book he puts out two days after Election Day uh, that uh, leads heavily on those pearls of wisdom. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for the invitation. Okay. Uh, we're going to be back. Well, we're going to shift gears. We're going to talk about culture, although not entirely shifting gears because part of our conversation is going to be about Trevor Noah and whether he can have the kind of influence on opinion that John Stewart once did. But is the world poor or your soul poor? I know that you're trying to get known more, but this is the nonsense you got fired from The Apprentice for. And shouts to Clinton, she's about to trump you. Make sure you ask him what. From 1993, well, especially from 1993 to about 1996, if you weren't cool enough to have plans on Friday night, you had an option. You could watch a cool TV show in an era where there weren't that many cool TV shows. It was The X-Files, and not only was it a cool TV show, but it was maybe sort of a counter-narrative letting you in on fictional secrets that made you feel as though maybe the people who had really fun things to do on Friday nights weren't so smart about life anyway. So uh, The X-Files is back. It had a much longer run than that, but it, it moved to, I think, Sunday nights. Uh, it's back. It was on last night, Sunday night, uh, and it's a reboot. Uh, it's They're reopening the files. Uh, so to join us and talk about that and one other topic as well, uh, one of our favorite TV critics, Willa Paskin from Slate.com. Thanks for coming back to the show, Willa. Thanks for having me. So the the first question, I guess, is, you know, I mean, for me anyway, The X-Files was a product of a particular place in a particular time. I mean, the 90s were really different in a lot of ways from 2016. So, And, and I know watching, I've seen a lot more episodes than I have, uh, but watching last night's uh, episode, they clearly were trying to deal with that by introducing, for example, you know, a much more handsome version of Alex Jones with this kind of web TV show that's kind of on all the time, apparently. Uh, but basically, you know, embodying the modern day truther, not an idealist like Fox Mulder, but uh, something considerably more serpentine than that. Right. I mean, in this moment of like false flag operations, as someone as the guy, the character you just mentioned says, and sort of just really conspiracy theories that are obsessed over and believed on the internet in real detail, the exile tried to reframe itself as uh, a conspiracy theory sort of in that mold, as opposed to this kind of lone quest of, of Fox and with an assist from Scully from time to time. I mean, I think so. I'm not sure that it's really aged as poorly as, as you might imagine. I mean, I think the reason they wanted to reboot it in the first place is because there's something kind of streamlined about, the entire premise of the X-Files um, and especially the standalone episodes that makes it seem like the kind of show you could start remaking, whether it's, you know, has some wear and tear and aging in the actual premise or not. Right. So and, and uh, to me, though, another aspect of the wear and tear is the idea that um, I like in the 90s, of course, when the, when the X-Files came on, there really wasn't an Internet. I mean, we sort of start our notion of the age of the non-geek Internet somewhere around 1995. Uh, it moves out of CompuServe and Prodigy and people start having AOL accounts on really crappy dial up connections. Um, and, and from there, you have people gradually gaining the ability to effectively become their own little Fox Mulders and Dana Scully's kind of checking out things that they're interested in, vetting them, kind of cross tabbing them against other kinds of narratives. But at the beginning of this process, at the beginning of the X Files, and for a lot of its early duration, you kind of needed a champion. You, you, you. If you believed in any of this stuff, or wanted to believe in it, or found it entertaining to believe in it, then the notion of a Fox Mulder, this quixotic, you know, tilter at at alien windmills, was this guy who could go out and find things that you couldn't find. 
Yeah, go well, ahead. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, I think that that is completely true. And if the new episodes um, were a little better, certainly the first one, you might think that it's even better of a time for that. Like, it's true that we're all talking on the Internet all the time about conspiracy theories and you can look up anything and find hundreds of hits about it. But you still maybe need an FBI agent to go <laughs> actually check out if something's real or not. I mean, the volume of nonsense has increased, right? So right. maybe you need a truth seeker even more than you did before. And I suppose the other thing is that, you know, it, it, the, the the gap between something happening and our becoming nostalgic for it has shrunk quite a bit. And, and <laughs> may, maybe there's maybe there's a sense of sort, of sort of looking at these icons of the 90s and thinking, well, those were the days when there was no Alex Jones or Jenny McCarthy or Sarah Palin or, you know, I mean, sure. you know, they kind of hark back to a simpler time. Yeah, I mean, they actually make a joke in a couple in the next episode, um, which is that they're both both Scully and Mulder are pre Google, which is to say they actually know things themselves and they don't have to look them up. Um, but I, I think that there's like a, there's a creakiness to the sense of humor of the show. Uh, it improves by the third episode. It starts to be actually funny as opposed to attempting to be funny by addressing these issues. Um, and I think there's I think there was room for the show to kind of address these in an interesting way, and it didn't necessarily do that in last night's episode anyway. Um, so, yeah, that, that does raise the, the question of what else it was that we liked about um, the X-Files. And, of course, part of it was that sort of constantly until later on unconsummated sense that these people, these two people were meant for one another in a way that extended far beyond their their crime fighting partnership. Um, and that's another thing that I guess I mean, I couldn't really tell last night, but I mean, obviously things move well beyond that, as they always do with Moonlighting and all the other shows that ever traded on that particular notion. But I, 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 having watched more episodes, are they going to get that whole sexual tension thing back somehow? Well, I thought it was handled very strangely in the first episode because it mentions that they've like lived together yeah. for years and are, are sort of have broken up because Fox is depressed and Fox. Mm -hmm. um, but in the next couple episodes, like it, it, it basically goes back to sort of what the coyness of the late season X Files, which was at some point, if I'm recalling correctly, we were supposed to understand that there was a kind of a whole relationship they were having that just sort of was not happening on camera, mm -hmm. particularly. Like that there were things that we were not seeing, and that that sort of returns that there's like, you know, there's sort of elliptical and coy about um, the dynamic between them, and we're left to kind of assume it's either exactly what we're seeing or there's some stuff that we're not seeing. You know, I mean, I think the thing about the show and the romance in particular is it was just like, you know, the show, is, the Exiles succeeds and fails as a matter of mood. Like, mm -hmm. it's yes. it's when it does the little creepy, awesome, strange, paranormal stories, and when it does this love story, both, um, they just didn't really feel like other versions of that on television. I mean, it's not as if the paranormal stories were on television at all, but in procedurals, it had like a, you know, an eeriness. And, and in the romance, it had this sort of yearning and patience that um, other things just don't have. And to, and to kind of recapture that, I mean, to have gotten that right the first time, I think was difficult enough to recapture it. It's like, you know, it's a hard it's a hard task they've set themselves. The uh, I'm, I'm curious, Willa, because uh, as a TV critic, you have to have sort of a mastery of the entire history of television. But I mean, <laughs> were, were you did you watch the X-Files? I, I can't I don't know how old you are. Did you watch the X-Files the first time? Around? I did. I did actually watch the X-Files. I'm in my mid-30s, um, and I did watch the X-Files. I wouldn't say that I have returned to it hundreds of times, and I'm definitely not encyclopedic about it, mm -hmm. and I probably have not seen every episode, but I definitely watched the X-Files, and, and I um, also, this is to like discredit my uh, reputation as an X-File, mm -hmm. like with a, a lover of the X-Files, which is that I always really loved the mythology episodes, which is sort of not cool to have preferred at this point everyone's like no no the really good stuff was the the, the one-off episodes right. but i am um, as a sucker for sort of soap operas and long-form narrative i was really interested in the deep alien mythology stuff which is also why the first episode was so disappointing because in that they return to the mythology and it just seems like such hokum and is so tonally stupid basically <laughs> that I, I made me want to go back and watch some of those episodes and see if I was 
just out of my mind. Yeah, I mean, that was the problem last night. I thought that Fox Mulder sounded borderline stupid. I mean, he, you know, I mean, this is this guy who's been obsessing about the, the mythology stuff, and we'll clarify those terms for you in just a second, for years and for his entire adult life. And then he has like a five-minute conversation with Joel McHale, and then he says, wait a minute, I've totally rethought this whole thing, yeah. and this this idea that I have never entertained at all, <laughs> is, you know, which is pretty uh, one of the uh, more obvious choices about what might actually be going on, has now entered my head, and I'm completely convinced I'm right. He sounded kind of dumb. But um, before we get into that, or we don't even have to get into that, but I just want to quickly um, clarify for the listeners who are not uh, X-File files. Uh, uh, so the mythology refers to this kind of notion, this kind of all through the arc of the many years of the series, there's this kind of uh, effort by Fox Mulder and then Dana Scully with him to make sense overall of reality. What kind of world are we living in? What level of, of collaboration is going on between sectors of, of, of the government and possible alien invaders? What of all these kind of strange question marks uh, that make up uh, his own reality uh, can be explained through some kind of conspiracy uh and so th- there's sort of that uh and that just sort of never ends and, and, and it's the through line and then there were these you know kind of twilight zone like one-off episodes as you say that were usually investigations of local monsters of some kind uh, and i don't know that it's necessarily cooler to like the one-offs i think i think uh it's okay it's a big tent willa i think you can it's, you know. it's definitely cooler to like the one-offs but i appreciate <laughs> i appreciate your sympathy with me and my love for mythology. All right. And and I think one of the things that they did well when they were really on their game back in those days was, I mean, it really was, it had been a long time since the movie All the President's Men, but they kind of got the the paranoia, the Washington paranoia of All the President's Men and, and things that came after it, like the uh, Parallax View, maybe didn't come after it, or the Pelican Brief, which I think sort of came out right around the same time. That sort of notion of meeting in garages where suddenly the headlights of some car would come on and starts feeding towards you and the person that you were talking to wasn't there anymore and it was sort of very chilling. I thought they, the, you know, that was sort of part of that mythology that the, the Washington wasn't this bright place with a mall and a monument. It was this dark place with a lot of subterranean meetings. Which, by the way, is a reason that it seems like it was a good time for a reboot, right? It's just like a lot of anxiety <laughs> and paranoia about our elected officials you don't uh, say. You don't say. Yeah. You know? <laughs> All right. Let's shift gears here. And speaking about the the kind of time it is, it is uh, you've got a highly featured piece at Slate right now. We're talking to Willa Paskin. It's about Trevor Noah, the heir uh, to the throne uh, upon which John Stewart sat for many years. Um, and although, as you say in the piece, it's not really as though his ratings have gone significantly down from the Stewart era, but uh, particularly in their target demo, you know, nothing, no horrible decline. But but there's sort of a sense. There's a relevance issue, right? There's a question about, is he in any way setting the tone of certain debates, altering the pace uh, of certain debates? There were ways in which Stewart kind of famously spoke truth to power, often to the power of the other mass media, that you just don't hear or notice Trevor Noah starting conversations of the same ilk. Am I summarizing this fairly? Yeah, I think you are. (laughs) I mean, I think that Trevor Noah is not doing a flat-out bad job. He's very telegenic. He's very handsome. Um, he is very on ease on camera. He's very pleasant, sort of. But in a way, that's like an abrogation of The Daily Show under Jon Stewart's kind of duty, which was not just to be smooth and easy and a pleasant thing to watch before you went to bed at night as, you know, network late-night shows tend to be, but to kind of be... Um, very funny, but maybe like a little more food for thought, maybe a little more infuriating, um, maybe a little more infuriating, but because you had company and Jon Stewart railing against it, you could go to sleep at night after after hearing about it. Uh, and I think that that's, I mean, I think that, that Jon Stewart is obviously had a really, has really big shoes to fill and Trevor Noah is um, unseasoned and has just begun and he may yet fill them, but that the way that they've proceeded, which is sort of, um, to kind of like do sort of John Stewart light and not to kind of figure out what Trevor Noah himself is really excellent at uh, has made the Daily Show feel pretty flat. Right to me, it's uh, after reading your piece, I was thinking about it and I was thinking some of it's in their eyes. So John Stewart's eyes. Uh, you know, held sort of three expressions about, I'd say about 45% of the time they were sort of almost pop-eyed with outrage and, and 
uh, well, well, without rage and rage. And then 45 percent of the time they were kind of hollow eyed with, oh, my God, <laughs> with just almost horror at how, at how bad things were. And then about 10 percent of the time there was sort of this wink, wink kind of joke that we're all in on. And that latter expression to me is the default setting for Trevor Noah's eyes that he's cooler than John Stewart. Yeah. He's kind of the guy at whose lunch table we might not be invited to sit. John Stewart was <laughs> was every schlub, right? I mean, he was this kind of schlubby, appalled, horrified little guy who, you know, you could definitely sit at his cafeteria table and he'd be quite entertaining. Trevor Noah looks kind of alarmingly popular. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the thing that's interesting is like, Obviously, outward is a big part of what John Stewart did and did so well. And when you say it like that, you think, well, isn't there room to improve? Like, we're all outraged all the time. We can get outraged anywhere. Why do we need to have the show that traffics so much on outrage? But I think when you see The Daily Show sort of without – it's not even outrage, but without sort of genuine feeling, without intensity of caring um, – it, it just sort of becomes a bunch of jokes about politics made by a guy who's like, this is crazy, totally understandably, because it is crazy, but without sort of the heart of it. And, and it, it just, I mean, why would you watch The Daily Show? You actually can get that joke many other places, and it's not on late at night. Right. Um, very quickly here, because we have to wrap, but I mean, you, you sent me to an example of, I thought, Noah doing something that he does very well. And it's a much longer clip in which he uh, rather brilliantly kind of limbs out the uh, the similarities between Donald Trump and African dictators. And he's got, you know, in this Daily Show style, these montages of Donald Trump saying things and then like Idi Amin saying exactly the same things or <laughs> Robert Mugabe. So let's, we'll, we'll quickly just hear how he ends that. Now, I understand that Trump is a little scary. (laughs) A little exotic for some. A little out of America's comfort zone. But this great country is capable of bold leaps. It took one in 2008 when it elected its first black president. Now, in 2016, I say it's time to be bold once more and elect America's first African president. (laughs) And when that happens... When a true African finally enters the Oval Office, the people of Africa will erupt into songs of praise. Mexican rapists. We don't have a word for Mexican rapists. All right, so he can't do African routines every night, even though obviously that would play to one of his strengths. But there is something Willie that he gets there. That, that piece overall is very, very funny in a way I think we want him to be. Yeah, no, and I think also what's interesting about that piece is obviously it comes from Trevor Noah's very specific point of view and his biography, and he brings something to The Daily Show that Jon Stewart never could have brought, which is this lens on African politics and the way that it actually overlaps with American politics as much as many Americans would laugh and scoff that, that, is, that there is any synchronicity there. But as you say, it's hard to do that every night. That can't be the only sort of frame to make jokes about American politics. And I think he, you know, he often makes jokes about Africa, and some of them are extremely funny, like that one. He made a really sharp one about Flint, Michigan, and uh, you know, asking his friends in Africa to donate $100 a day to save an American village, you know, which is extremely <laughs> sharp and uh, kind of lampoons American exceptionalism. But then he, you know, he makes other jokes during the State of the Union about um, Barack Obama when he's talking about the next five years of his tenure – and Trevor Noah suddenly flashes to him not giving up his seat as president because when you hear an African leader saying about talking about the next five years, that's what he's come to expect. And I'm not sure what the point of that joke is. Like, that's a joke at Africa's expense, and we really don't need to be watching that on The Daily Show because, believe me, there are enough jokes at Africa's expense out there in the world. So it's like he, he has this very distinctive point of view that they haven't quite figured out how to make the most of and to be consistent with all the time. And it's a tall order to do that, but that is sort of what they have to work towards. All right. Willa Paskin, great to hear your voice again on our show. Uh, We've got to take a break. We'll come back. We'll tell you about some people who still think Phil Collins is cool. Have you ever noticed that the X-Files conspiracy kills everybody who poses a threat to it, except Mulder and Scully? The only possible explanation is that they're secretly in on it. 
Today's show was produced from an undisclosed bunker by Betsy Kaplan and me, Kion Wolf. Greg Hill appeared in the intro and tweets for us at WNPR Colin until they silence him. Our interns are Tiana Duquette and Alexandra Ingber. The part of Bill Curry was played by Alex Trebek. For show pages, articles, and videos that the Here and Now staff don't want you to see, go to our website, wnpr.org slash Colin. On tomorrow's show, Unreliable Narrators. And now, back to Colin. A night of full Collins, uh, a full Collins tribute happening Saturday, January 30th at 7 p.m. at the Outer Space in Hamden. Brings together the work of a bunch of Connecticut musicians uh, who want to do something nice for Phil Collins. Phil Collins is kind of a controversial. He, he is another one of these divisive musical figures. But let's um, let's hear a few words from at least one person who is inflexible in his admiration for Phil Collins, that would be the psychotic or psychopathic killer played by Christian Bale in American Psycho. In terms of lyrical craftsmanship, sheer songwriting, this album hits a new peak of professionalism. Sabrina, why don't you uh, dance a little? Take the lyrics to Land of Confusion. In this song, Phil Collins addresses the problems of abusive political authority. In Too Deep, is the most moving pop song of the 1980s about monogamy and commitment. All right, so uh, joining us right now are uh, Frank Critelli and uh, Chris Bousquet, otherwise known as American Elm, uh, two of the musicians who uh, decided to put together this tribute. So, Frank, um, I, my understanding is part of this, part of the reason for this tribute is the fact that Phil Collins himself has been in more or less retirement. I don't think he's done a new album since 2002, hasn't toured since 2010, but now he says he's coming out of retirement, and some people's immediate reaction was, please don't. That's, a, that's exactly right. Um, actually, Phil Collins has been suffering from a violent inferiority complex for a very good long time, and I think there's no reason for that. So, uh, Chris Bousquet, if you were to make the argument for, I mean, okay, so, for example, Joe Queen, in, in his so now forgotten book about American bad taste, devotes an entire chapter to who's worse, Billy Joel or Phil Collins. Uh, and so if you were to make the case for taking Phil Collins a lot more seriously, for people who currently don't, what case would you make? Well, I mean, I think the, the mistake we always make is, like, the wholesale dismissal of things. Like, I used to always argue with people about bread, and I can tell a lot about what someone thinks about music on what their opinion is the band bread. You know, and so Phil's sort of the same way. He was sort of pop radio, but some of those songs are really great. You know what I mean? And, like, I would say the same thing. I'm not a Billy Joel fan, really, but the same thing. Like, if, you know, listen to Allentown or something. It's, it's a great song. You know, you can't deny it. It's not... It's not New Order or <laughs> Leonard Cohen or something, but why does it have to be? You know, it's its own thing. All right, maybe it would be helpful also, uh, to, as we talk a little bit about the evolution, too, of Phil Collins. Uh, he was the drummer for Genesis. He, he came out from behind the drums when Peter Gabriel left. I was uh, lucky enough to see a Genesis tour where he was the front man holding a trumpet for the entire night, a trumpet which he never played. But let's uh, play a song from roughly that period, 1983. This is Just a Job to Do. So, Frank Critelli, looking at some of the online publicity for this night of full Collins, well, I, we can even talk about that, uh, the name, the, a night of full Collins, the implication or maybe the explicit uh, statement being, you know, it's not just going to be the hip, cool, edgy, prog rock Genesis stuff. It's going to be all of it. It's going to be some of the top 40 hits and God help us, even the Disney work that, that, <laughs> that, you know, that, you know, although uh, Chris Bousquet says, well, you, you could be kind of discriminating and not throw out the baby with a the bath. There's also an argument being made for t taking the baby and the bath and enjoying all of it. I say enjoy all of it. Actually, the name came from Paul Bilbusti of Mercy Choir and that it would be a night of Phil Collins, that we would just be doing the music of Phil, of Phil Collins that particular night. And so, Frank, what, what's, uh, do you know what material you will be sharing with the audience? I have been uh, doing a Collins song for years, and it's called That's All. Mm. Actually, so I'll, be, well, I'll we, be playing that song. We, we can't play the Frank Critelli version, but let's hear just a, a tiny bit of That's All. Just as I thought it was going all right, I found out I'm wrong. Say day, and you'd say night. Tell me it's black when I know that it's white. 
So it's not the American Songbook standard that Adam Sandler sings at the end of Wedding Singer. That's a different, that's all. So, um, and uh, uh, Chris, what are you uh, going to be playing on Saturday night? I'm doing Against All Odds, which is actually a song I've liked since it was in like the movie Against All Odds. I remember being a kid and that video would come on MTV knowing it was a great song and then probably later in my young hipsterism sort of rejecting it. And like one day, maybe six months ago, I was in the car and it came on the radio and I was kind of blown away by how great it is. So that's what I'm doing. So And so, Chris, you are explicitly, therefore, exploring the period when when sort of you know, I mean, there really are two constituencies here, right? There are progressive rock purists who, who kind of dug Genesis, but maybe even thought Genesis was getting a little too pop near the end of things. And then there's the much larger cohort of people who really do embrace Phil Collins's, uh, you know, just top 40 hits and, and collaborations with Philip Bailey and, and all kinds of stuff like that. You probably live a little bit more in that first world, but the song you're exploring is very much from that second world. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. So, uh, so are you are you going to put a particular stamp on this, like a kind of indie stamp on the way you do this song? Yeah, I think what happens to me every single time I do something like this is I try to come up with something crazy and interesting, and then in the end, it sounds like a song I would have done anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to hear one of the other people performing with you uh, is uh, Russell Sh- Shaddox, and this is going to be uh, his version uh, of a Phil Collins song. And I've lost my place. Oh, it's Blood on the Roof- Rooftop. Rooftops, a much older song. That's from '76. Here we go. Here's Blood on the Rooftops. Let's skip the news, boy. I'll make some tea The abs and the juice, boy Too much for me I kind of like that. I may be coming to a Phil Collins event, and I, I wouldn't have guessed that would ever, ha- ever have, have, have happened. But Frank Rutilli, I suppose that's part of it, too, right? To get people to maybe rethink their musical prejudices a little bit? Of course. Um, you can't really blame somebody for putting music into the world. It's, a, it's always a beautiful thing. It might not always appeal to you. It might not be palatable to your taste, but it's still a good thing. So we should say that when Phil Collins announced that he was coming out of retirement, there was even a petition that said Phil Collins has announced he's no longer in retirement. There's far too much suffering in the world as it is. This must be stopped. So Chris, Bus- uh, Chris Bousquet, this is kind of you guys lighting a little candle against that darkness. Yeah, I'm sort of tired of Internet meanness, you know, which is like even like last week with Glenn Fry dying, you had a whole bunch of people to make sure everyone knew like how terrible they thought the Eagles were. And I'm like, what's the point of that? You know what I mean? Like my wife, for instance, loves the Eagles. It's like one of her favorite things. So why would I why does someone need to come out and say how terrible something is? Right. Yeah. So love what you love. Uh, and if you love Phil Collins, it's a night of full Collins, the Phil Collins tribute happening Saturday, January 30th, 7 p.m. Outer space in uh, Hamden. Uh, Frank, how do they get tickets or do, how, how do they how do people attend this? Tickets are absolutely free. All you need to do is show up. Wow. All right. What could be better? All right. So a whole bunch of Connecticut bands and music, music, musical artists with a tribute to Phil Collins. We're going to go out with, it turns out, <laughs> Betsy, Betsy Kaplan's least favorite Phil Collins hit. I was just doing this to make her happy, and it turns out she's not going to get up and dance. <laughs> Scully, I finally figured it out. What now, Mulder? What have you figured out? The meaning of Susu Studio. The Phil Collins song? Okay. What does it mean? If I say it, the extra... Tr- the aliens will probably cut into this broadcast. But I don't care. The meaning of Susu Studio is... Oh, there are some things in life. Give me a hand, 
Yeah, I'm actually remain a mystery. <laughs> 